Um, doctor. Hello. So, isn't it cool? That is you cool. wish. You, you're so far away, Alex, from being a doctor. <laughs> I'm. Well, yeah, I didn't do seven years of... <laughs> well, it's probably longer, actually. How, how long was it? Hey, so how long does it take? Um, so t- usually it takes about five years. I've done three degrees, so I spent eight years in uni. Eight years. Wow. Is that, oh, that's a lot of debt. Is that, that, you should put that's that, a lot of debt. That's a lot of debt. <laughs> also, Better become a really good doctor after that. <laughs> that's a great way to kick off any date. By the way, I have three degrees... So how many, so what are the degrees in? So I did medical sciences first. Yeah. And then I went into medicine after that. Worked as a doctor for a couple of years and then went back and did a master's in nutrition. Did you always know you wanted to be a doctor? No, I, I thought I would be an accountant. Like, so just like my dad, that's kind of what my parents kept telling me I was going to do, yeah. but I didn't find it, you know, interesting or anything. Um, So the long, short story is when I was 14, my dad had a stroke and died. Yeah, it was quite traumatic. Um, How old was he? I was 14. You were 14. He was? He was in his 60s. Oh, my God. And um, it was after that that I decided, okay, I want to do something in healthcare. And I didn't really know if I wanted to be a doctor or be a nurse or what it would be. So I did some like... You know, when you're in school, you can do some work experience and realize that, yeah, I wanted to be a doctor, but pretty late. So maybe I was like 16, 17. And so I was doing my equivalent of the A-levels back in Ireland. Mm. I didn't get the grades that I needed for medicine, sadly. So I went to Wales, did medical sciences, and then got that degree and moved into medicine as a graduate. So it was a bit of a roundabout way. Wow. I mean, to lose anyone at any point in your life is is pretty hard but to lose someone at 14 years old yeah it changes you completely you like go from being a kid to being an adult overnight why does that happen i think well for me it was just me and my mum in the house then because my older sisters had moved out they'd gone to uni left home got married so i was just like right well i'm the second adult now and um i think when your parents grieving you kind of feel like you need to suck it up and just get on with life. Mm. At 14 years Mm. old. That's so young. That is so, and and also, um, I think typically as a, as a daughter, fathers are sort of everything. Yeah. Right. You know, I, you always say, I always heard this thing in psychology. They always say, if you know that your father loves you that as a, as a daughter, if you get your father's love, then you know that you're worthy for love as well. And I think that's with sons as well a lot of the time. Yeah. So fathers play an important role. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's awful. Yeah. H- how did you deal with the grief? I mean, I dealt with it pretty well, I think, up to maybe 16. And then I went down a bit of a hole of just really isolating myself from my friends. And I think once I knew my mum was okay, I was like, right. Then I started to grieve. You can finally, finally yeah. let go, yeah. And then had a really terrible year and took a lot of time out of school. So I think that also contributed to not really getting the grades I needed. But I came through it in the end and I feel like going through it makes me almost like a better doctor because I understand what like really deep grief feels like. Um, Yeah, not to set the the podcast off. I know, I know, I know. But also, but also I can feel that you you still get emotional. Yeah, I do. And by the way, this is a, look, I've cried here. Alex has cried here. Everyone's got emotional. So that's why it's the greatest thing. That's why podcasting as a medium is so great because you, TV for some reason, I don't know why this happens. You sit there and you feel, God, but for podcasting, it becomes a lot more intimate. Yeah, because you're not really aware that there's people watching. You feel like you're just. In someone's living room with loads of microphones. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 That's actually what Jamie's living room is like. It's really bizarre. But um, um, yeah, I think it's amazing that you can still show vulnerability with it. Because uh, I think what a lot of time, what a lot, a lot happens, right, is that you, um, you deal with the grief of whatever happens. And then typically again you block it but then you experience whatever it is comes out anxiety ptsd lots of different things Mm. as you know way better than me but then actually people find it quite hard to revisit that a lot of the time because it's so painful to do it but obviously with you you can revisit it because you know that's healthy to to be able to revisit it yeah i think i think previously i used to move on from it really quickly because i realized how awkward it made other people (laughs) 
because it is kind of awkward when yeah, it doesn't make i don't know why that happens and so, to people it, yeah. it is because you feel like a burden don't you're, you're like you're oh like... i'm really sorry and you're like well it was you know it was like a long time ago and i'm okay and yeah it's a really terrible thing that happened but i think it's it almost normalizes talking about really crap things in your life yeah. and like how you've come through it and although it was the worst thing that ever happened to me it put me on a path that produced this like was, incredible life that I have. I was yeah. going to say, I think whenever there's something of like extreme negativity, there's always like an equal and opposite the, yeah. the other way. Like, so this massively positive thing has come out of that, which is now your career and, and it pushed you down that path, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It seems, it sounds like a little bit woo, but I'm like, I feel like it gave me a purpose in what I do in my mm. life. I, I, I remember my um, business partner, a guy called Ed, um, he went to a talk of this, this, this lady who um she was got onto a tube she was going to her new job it was in marketing or advertising um and she got on the tube she was super excited it was early in the morning and she got on the tube she saw some guy come sit next to her who looked a bit weird um he was being shifty and things like that and uh next thing she did she woke up in hospital and it was on the tube bombings mm -hmm. and she survived but she lost both of her legs and so she could never walk in ptsd everything did and Ed went to a talk of hers and she said at the end, what you can do in life is you can curse things and hate things and, and say, why, why, why? And always wish that it didn't happen. And what if, and what if, or you see things as a blessing and you go, no. And she said at the end, if what happened to me was awful, but I wouldn't now be standing in front of all of you people telling my story and how actually, if you really look at the positive things of life, um, that's the way to sort of progress forward. And with you, I think it's the same thing. Is that such an awful thing to happen to you? But now you get to go and help different individuals around the world through your voice, through your medicine, whatever it is. And that's, you probably wouldn't have done that. You would be an accountant. Yeah. Probably bought a, <laughs> Jesus. You might have saying some people some money though. Yeah. Depending on how good you are. True, <laughs> true. So does that mean but, yeah. when you speak to individuals who have gone through grief, you can relate much easier to it then, as you said? Yeah, definitely. I think the first couple of times that you lose a patient when you're starting out as a doctor is just really difficult. And then I was getting really emotional because I was like, oh my God, I'm feeling what they're feeling. And you grow through that a little bit, but I still think I maintain that because everyone says, you know, like doctors are so hard to trauma, like, you know, people are bleeding it in front of you and you're just, you know, poker face. <laughs> but oh God. Yeah. Um, but I think it makes me more compassionate because of that, because I know what that person's feeling. Yeah. And so although my job is not to just sit there and, and comfort them and worry about them all the time, but like to help their, their, their family member who's sadly passed away or is passing away. Mm. Um, I think it's really important. And what I remember from my experience is how good the doctors were yeah. with my mum. And just explaining things like in really simple terms. And so that's, I just kind of, when I'm speaking to patients, I think about it like you're speaking to your mates, like how you'd explain to them in medical terms what's happening. Well, you have to be, I suppose, quite matter of fact as well in those situations. Mm -hmm. I would just be awful. I can't tell anyone. Just waffle. I, yeah, I had to cancel on a dinner this Friday and I couldn't do it. I I couldn't do sorry, it. is this you telling a patient? <laughs> sorry, this, that I can go for dinner with them. <laughs> go for dinner with all my patients. <laughs> what, to break them the news? Yeah, yeah. Nah, just uh, go on dates yeah. with them. I like going on dates with all my patients. <laughs> but, but I couldn't do that. So I don't understand how, obviously it's training and things like that, but to approach such awful situations and... And I think being a doctor is interesting, right? Because you, you go through, it, it's such highs and lows. Mm. Um, there's really, and it's that typical cheesy saying, which is no day is like the same. You know, it's it, no day is the same. Um, you know, when you have to, uh, as a doctor, have to deliver not great news, you know, how, that, how do you deal with that situation? Because you do have to sort of take away any sort of your own emotions. Mm. And you have to be, as you said, poker face. You have to, because then you, that that's what how basically what I'm saying is how do you separate work life from home life? Because mm. home life is where you're Hazel and you, you know, do your podcasts and all those different things, but then you go into your work life, which is being a doctor, and it's two separate things. They have to be. Yeah. It's really tricky. Like in medical school, you learn how to deliver bad news. Like you go through workshops, but it's how to deliver it and like what it is for the patient, but you don't learn how to cope with it. For, so, you don't learn for yourself. Yeah. And I that's a bit of a bugbear for me because like I mean, 
all of us work through the pandemic and mm. I was a COVID doctor for 18 months. And for a lot of that, I lived by myself. So I'd like go to work, come home. We're in a lockdown. Lots of people died. Just carry on like watch Netflix when you get home. <laughs> it's just like this really That's mad. strange, yeah, really strange thing. And I got into the habit of just sending myself voice notes on my way home because I was like, if I don't talk about this, mm. something bad's going to happen to me because I'd never You're storing experienced. It. Yeah. yeah. So I've got all these voice notes on my phone that I haven't listened to yet. And it's just like all the dates of my shifts. Is that really? like journaling? Sort of. But yeah. I felt like just, I was so tired. I didn't want to like sit down with a journal and write it down. So I, I like was pretty matter of fact. I was like, night shift. This is what happened. This is what this good thing happened this terrible thing happened this yeah. is how i feel i'm going to sleep <laughs> oh I, I, guess, I guess like i was go, just watching netflix going, I mean, going this back is... to uh going back to the grief like how you said you maybe didn't deal with it it's kind of the same thing you're like you're experiencing this emotion and just shutting it off shutting yeah. it off shutting it off so it's still there yeah and eventually that's going to build up right? yeah that's it and you need to learn how to like is that how trauma works yeah, you kind of, you have to allow yourself to experience it, to, to, to get over it and like be able to observe it. Because if you just, if you just like leave it there, it does stay somewhere. Yeah. Like you, you do store it. You just go into the stress cycle, don't you? And I think that's why so many people are burnt out after the, you know, the pandemic, not just doctors, but, you know, parents who are why. staying at home, working full time, also homeschooling, all of that kind yeah. of stuff. It, it's interesting because typically I, I spoke to psychotherapists about this. Um, and it's funny how many doctors, uh, therapists, psychotherapists go through burnout. Mm. And he's he said to me that actually loads of uh, doctors actually then get such bad burnout where they can't think of anything worse than talking to another patient. And that must be because you're you're dealing with so much trauma all the time yeah. that you and you're not dealing with it yourself. And then it comes out as burnout. Yeah, you become oh. so you just like lose all compassion that you and empathy that you can't deal with patients because you're just so done. You're like in survival mode. You can't yeah. take any more emotions. So you have to become like a robot. I guess. Yeah, that's it. Wait, so Hazel, did you work on, did you work in the NHS during COVID then? Yeah. Wow. What was it like? <laughs> it was crazy. At the beginning, was it scary? Yeah. I, I was doing a gastro nutrition job at the time and I was going to actually take a few months out to finish my next book. And that was on a Wednesday. And it was like my last day and I was so excited to have a break from the NHS. And then one of my uh, senior kind of doctors came over to me and he was like, on Friday, we're opening a new COVID ward. This is at the very start of it. We're, we're changing this ward, which was a gastro ward, like gut ward into a COVID ward. Mm. We need you to help. And you don't have to. And I was like, well, obviously I'm going to help. So I finished work on that Wednesday and then started as COVID doctor on the Friday and then stayed there for however, 18 months, but rotated through different specialties. So we were a COVID ward. Then I did intensive care COVID as a nurse for a little while because we didn't have enough nurses. And then I did COVID follow-up clinics. So that was like patients who were in intensive care and needed like follow-up long COVID clinics just basically 18 months of doing a job that I'd never been trained to do. Mm. Like so you just have to pivot straight away. You just have to you get your hands dirty. And we were all like doctors who are like, obviously you're trained in general med medicine. Yeah. But all of the doctors in my ward are, you know, focused on the gut. And so we were dealing with something that's like very much a lung based mm. condition. And so it was chaos for the first two weeks. Wow. And we just had so many patients, you know, I work at, in a central London hospital. So the first peak was just firefighting. Mm. Yeah. That is insane. so, and, and also when it was, and I, you know, it, it's some of these things that it's so strange that we had this period in our lives where we couldn't leave our house and everyone was terrified of it. Um, when were, were you scared of catching it at the beginning? But everyone was just on the team getting COVID one after the other. So it became like a staffing issue then. You're just working my first uh, like week on shifts was like seven days in a row, which mm. isn't really what you should be doing because we were just having staffing issues. Um, How many hours is that? How many hours do you work for? Well, I mean, typically you'd work like a full day, but you have to work long days and for COVID, I lost count of how many hours I was working because I was just leaving when it was safe to leave, yeah. when someone could take over. Right. Um, so I don't even know how many hours I worked that first week. Um, but 
I had COVID the week before. I didn't know I had it until afterwards, but yeah. I was off with high fever, loss of taste and smell, cough, all of that. So I kind of had an inkling that I had it and I thought maybe my antibodies would carry me through, mm-hmm. um, which they seem to have. Um, but I would come home from shifts and I'd be in bed and then I'd be like, I've got COVID on my hair. And I'd have to get into the shower at like 3 oh, no. a.m. Oh, I, w- I was God. so paranoid. That's, I was like, I've got COVID I can on see hair. it. I can see it on my hair. <laughs> yeah. Really? So you then have to go to the bathroom to start washing was, your hair because you thought you had COVID on it? I developed like this weird OCD. And then what? I, I know you would, you would though. It I was crazy. And I was, you know, I'd have in the beginning we had really terrible PPE. You'd think that we were just You went there was like bin bags and shit. It was literally like, like yeah. I was a canteen lady, not like a doctor. It was just a little <laughs> penny. Some mash. <laughs> He's a mash. Yeah. What? And so <laughs> it was no surprise that everyone got COVID in the beginning. But as time went on, then we had like full on, you know, from top to bottom PPE. But still I was like covid is on me that, that is like an ocd slash paranoia though yeah i had this i, I was telling alex that in my ocd for so so do you do you get ocd occasionally i ha- i mean i'm quite an anxious i think i'm quite an anxious person but i'd never had ocd before so that was really yeah, but it's a new thing that kicks in i was like well this all is it, all it took was a, <laughs> a deadly virus <laughs> and a pandemic <laughs> I, can, I can i'm happy to say i'm over it now i'm like over the covid <laughs> now, I think there is a little bit in your hand <laughs> yeah. a little bit less <laughs> Hey, so I had this the other day. I, so I have OCD sometimes, right? Which is manifest and things like, okay, I can't walk across those three drains because otherwise my head's going to pop. Your, your OCD is slightly different. No, <laughs> no, I'm not. not like superstitious. Yeah, yeah, there is. And then... I walk this, under this, yeah, this, a ladder this and this I freak is, out. This one's quite weird. Are you going to talk about the thing in your the, fridge? Yeah, the, the fridge. <laughs> it's so weird. No, but what, if you feed it, right? So, and also, look, I'm not you. I'm if not you saving... you feed it, what, your fridge? <laughs> yeah, I'm feed the fridge. I'm not saving lives. I'm trying to compare our lives, which is not right. But I, I get OCD occasionally. And I had it as a kid, and I explained this on another podcast. And if you feed the OCD, it gets worse and worse and worse, right? Yeah. So you have to expose yourself to the situation. It was a, a couple of weekends ago, and I made a tuna mayonnaise thing, and I put it into a bowl, and I sort of meshed it up and things like that. And then I couldn't find a place back in the fridge to put the mayonnaise pot. I couldn't find it to the point where I was like, oh my God, I can't put it anywhere. So I just had to hold it because my OCD was so bad. I couldn't find the spot to find the mayonnaise, where the mayonnaise should go. I'm just loving the look. Is that weird? The the confusion. You're like, right. Okay. (laughs) Is that a weird thing to have? So would you not just put it back into the spot that you removed it from? Hazel, I tried. I couldn't find the spot. I couldn't find the spot. For some reason, it didn't sit well with me. My anxiety OCD was so high that I couldn't find a spot to put it back in that would work. Is that weird? I feel like OCD and anxiety disorders just manifest in so many mm. weird and wonderful ways. How does your anxiety manifest? I ruminate. I like stay up at night and think about <laughs> everything terrible that's going to happen. Oh, oh, I love, I love <laughs> that's doing a real that. good. I love that. <laughs> that's my idea of good weekend. <laughs> I mean, I've gotten better over the years and like... Well, better, I, better at staying up late. <laughs> I can stay up to like six now. I can really get into it. <laughs> so <laughs> hardcore. Yeah. So you basically catastrophize all night. Yeah, I just, I mean, I don't do it all the time, but like that's typically how it manifests. Or um, yeah, I just will get into these cycles. And during the pandemic, I got into them, you know, wow. really badly. But I, I, you know, reached out and had a therapist during that time, which was really helpful and I feel very privileged to say that I could get that support because we did have like on hand psychologists yeah. because they knew how traumatizing it would be for doctors and nurses and everyone else in the hospital. But it wasn't like super accessible. And also if you're working like really bizarre shifts and you're very busy, you're not gonna be like, sorry guys, I need an oh, hour with a, with a therapist. Yeah, sorry guys, I need my, I'm freaking out. It's in my hair. I need to have that hour. I, I, I feel it's, it's insane. There's that really interesting book. Uh, this is going to hurt. Yes. Um, and I read, I started to read that on holiday and I found it very funny. And there's lots of things that I found interesting about it. You forget that doctors are humans. Do, yeah. do, do you know what I mean by that? You, you're, you're obviously not a robot. No. Why would you be a robot? But I think a lot of people feel like that's how you should be. And, and so you have emotions, you have anxieties, you have relationships, you have holiday, you have all these things that go on. And I think as humans, we forget that. We think you're there just to serve and save. Mm. And that when you don't, when something goes wrong, which naturally happens in everyday life, you're the ones to blame. And I suppose it must be difficult when you have patients or individuals or see it happen, especially in the NHS, where 
something awful has happened and you've had to, and you get the blame for it when you know it's not your fault. Mm. And also tiredness must be a complete killer because <laughs> you're saving lives. We all know how bad tiredness is. Mm. And, and we also know that we're like a generation of being tired now. And you guys must it's get... All, it's all the rumination. It's all, it's no, no room for sleep. <laughs> no room for sleep. How important is sleep? Can I ask? Do you know this? <laughs> it's very I've heard, yeah. I've heard, I've heard it's actually quite good for you. Yeah, but I, yeah, I've heard I've loads heard. of things. The benefits of sleep are... And also that I heard that dementia is linked with lack of sleep. Yeah. I mean, sleep is one of those like really easy, low hanging fruit that you can... Imp- if you work on your sleep, it's like you can improve your health in so many different ways. It's good for like memory mood cognition so like yeah attention concentration also like it's linked to your metabolism like your blood glucose so many different things so there's loads of really interesting research from people who work night shifts because they tend to have really poor health and that's thought to be because we stay up at night we eat at night we do all the things at night that your body's not really primed to do Mm. So like nurses have like really high rates of heart disease, for example, and things like that. Really? Yeah. Because you're, you're doing it so out of the evolutional cycle. I yeah. Guess. Like, so your circadian rhythm, you know, like your... What is that? I don't know like, what that is. Basically your internal body clock. Yeah. Um, like your sleep-wake cycle. We're all in sync with like the sun and the moon. And so if you're up at night when your body's like producing hormones to get you to go to sleep... And everything's kind of like shutting down, but, you know, starting to repair. But you're like, you know, eating a McDonald's at 3 a.m., mm. looking at patient notes, really stressed. That's not good for your health. That is not good for your health. Mm-hmm. What, what Mackies would you be? That's a big question. <laughs> Those nuggets would come flying at <laughs> late at night. Woo! I want to... The only thing I, that's open at 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's open at 3 a.m. It's just full of nurses and doctors, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. And it's right sorry, across the Sorry, hospital. aren't you supposed to be digesting your health? You're like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm just having a, <laughs> a little bit of a moment. Yeah, yeah. I heard this. I heard this rumor the other day. I don't know if it's true. Is that the reason why? <laughs> if you, if you, the reason why they used to send schoolboys on cross country runs in the morning at school is to lower their testosterone so they weren't as horny. Really? Yeah. Is that tr- is that true that if you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it would have to be really intense exercise to lower your testosterone. But I imagine it's just more too like tired. Burn them out. Yeah, 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 so yeah. they can't be horny. They're so, too tired. I, I honestly think that honestly, and I, forgive me, but I think too many boys were masturbating at school and they had to work out. It's a personal story. It's not a personal story. I got told this. I think I think this was it's a not, personal journey. It's not, why they sent me on? A, why they sent me on another twenty mile run? Because <laughs> you won't stop wanking, Jamie. That's no, right. It's true there with these schoolboys. And they went, how do we stop them from <laughs> masturbating? These schoolboys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on, boys, we're going on a run. <laughs> Put your penises away. We're going on a run. But it's true. And they 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 send all the boys that the headmaster decided that it was a good idea to send all the boys on a run every single morning to to drain them of testosterone. Did it work? Oh, yeah, it really did. I stopped <laughs> stopped it straight away. <laughs> but is that uh, not it's because something with exercise yeah. I thought exercise exercise heightened testosterone, but it lowers it. No, it can heighten it. Like oh. if you're like but if you are exercising excessively, then you're gonna drop your testosterone. It's why like people who train a lot and don't feel enough will get like a really low sex drive because you can get it's like cor- it, cortisol you get like burnout essentially you yeah. like overstress your body because there's some there's some like bodybuilders and trainers and stuff that train so much that their body just like fucking shuts and probably down probably take some other stuff and they as take well. uh yeah that G- oh yeah yeah look at him trying to oh he, there's something <laughs> he, um he, <laughs> he, became, something. he, he became convinced he that took I, steroids he I took steroids I got, it, I got into quite good shape when someone were in france and just, he was ripped. he wouldn't he wouldn't he wouldn't let it go what were those pills that you used to take every morning i was doing a protein world they were protein, <laughs> protein pills. World. Like I, was, I was there we go that's what it's i was being was. paid by protein world you, you were so, taking the same shit where have i taken anything i've never taken anything sorry what have you what did you just do this morning Oh my God. So Hazel, this is what I'm going to tell 10 you. 10 mile run. You can probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start, yeah. yeah. So yeah. feels like, are you wanking again? You need to get your shoes yeah, on. Yeah, sorry. For a run. Yeah, yeah. I just, my porn room had to be turned off. <laughs> so you have a porn room? No, I don't have a porn so room. So it's, it's, cinema room. <laughs> no, it's just for porn. <laughs> it's just a porn. I'm going to get on to porn, how bad it is. But um, no, I, I was going to say this to you earlier. If you can, I'm, <laughs> I, I've just started doing a personal trainer session um, and he injects me with steroid. <laughs> <laughs> But he gave me this drink at the oh, beginning. You should have asked me that on the lie detector. If you're taking steroids. Yeah, and I could have uh, shut you up. We, he gave me this drink in the morning. He said, this will, you take this, it'll wake you up. 
And I went, all right. And so I just drank it. And he said, there's a little bit of caffeine in there. I don't, there was definitely caffeine in there. Because then what's happened now, which I still have, I'm salivating so much where if I put my mouth over a bottle, I'd drool. Really? What, what, what is that? What is over salivating? So I, I phoned my mum and she said, I got that when I was pregnant. Are you pregnant? I was like, no, I don't think so. Over salivating from taking caffeine. Your mum must have been like, "You're 33 years old. Why are you phoning me?" <laughs> she did say that. <laughs> she said, "Why are you phoning me? Why are you phoning? Is that something?" Uh, I don't think you get it from caffeine. I mean, it depends on what else was in the drink. Did you get tingly skin? Yeah, a little tingly mouth. Yeah, so That's, there's like beta uh, alanine. Uh, what is that? It's like something they put in pre-workout, which can like help you keep going for longer, but. Typically, it makes your skin really tickly. And I think that's why like a lot of people like it because they're like, it's working, but it can make you really itchy. So maybe you were having a weird reaction to it. Isn't there something called like ni- niacin? It makes your skin flush. You go like bright red. I have no red. idea. I think bodybuilders take it. I have no idea. But also, you, you've written books. Mm-hmm. You've got your podcast. Um, you're known as the food medic. <laughs> uh, you're, you're essentially just an, an, you know, you're an, an amazing nutritionist as well as amongst other things. And, and your, where would you say your expertise lie? Is it in gut health? Mm, I don't know. I think like nutrition, I guess, is my main area. I never specialized, but yeah. I did work in gastro for a long time. Um, and I'm actually taking a little break from the NHS to focus on the nutrition side of things. Um, so yeah, that's my main focus, but also female health. Like that's my next books on female health, but not like women's health, gynae, babies, that kind of typical thing that Mm -hmm. people think of. But like, I don't know if you guys know this, but most of the research we have is based on a male body. What? Yeah. Like majority of the research of 70 kilo white male body is like what most of our research is based on. What what percentage are we talking if you had to guess? Mm, I mean, it's changing now because it has to, but I would say like... 70%. 70%. Is that purely because of who was doing the research back in the day that kind of founded medicine, modern medicine? Kind of. There's like loads of reasons. So basically women are considered like really problematic because we've got like fluctuating hormones and a menstrual cycle. We could get pregnant. So you can't give us drugs in a trial in case. Jamie always says that. How pro- <laughs> problematic women are. He's real chauvinist this guy. <laughs> that is insane where a woman's body is way more complicated than a man, surely. Yeah. And yet there's less knowledge about it. Yeah, so that's well, So the they thing. saw it, they were like, oh, we can't be asked for this. It's too, it's too stressful. Basically, to basically, <laughs> they're like, this is too much hassle. Like, just stick with a male. And then we'll just say women are slightly smaller, yeah? And they're all like, yeah, that sounds like a valid. What? Yeah. So, and I started thinking about this a lot, like in the last couple of years. And there's been more like research coming out about like how different women are to men. And I was like, this is so bizarre because I'm like treating women all the time. Yeah. Based on research on a a man's body. And so there's all this like really interesting stuff to say, like women, for example, experience heart attacks differently. So they're like less likely to be treated on time and they're more likely to die. That's in the UK. Really? Yeah. Just quickly on that. I, I always hear that when a man is having a heart attack, they feel like they need a poo. That's why a lot of men die oh on God. the loo. <laughs> no. Yes, it's true. No, that, that's probably from a straining point of view. I, I thought that's why Elvis and people were found dead on the loo because they um, it felt like they were having a heart attack. They felt like they need a poo. You can feel sick, but I don't know about the whole, like, need a poo <laughs> symptom. <laughs> So, so, so what is it? So, so, yeah, so if you really need to poo, I don't think you need to worry I'm freaking about a heart attack. Yeah, because I'm every, having a heart attack about time five times a day. Just, just to clarify, <laughs> central cr- crushing chest pain, feeling sweaty, feeling nauseous. That's like typical heart heart attack symptoms. <sighs> that happens to me all the time when I'm anxious. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> when you can't find where to put them in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I'm having a heart attack. Oh, God, I've pooed myself. <laughs> I don't know if I'm having a heart attack or I've got OCD or I just need to poo. I don't know which one's going on. Wait, hang on. So women experience it differently to men. So how do men experience experience it crushing yeah. you know, that sort yeah, of pain. typically and how like do it, women do it so i mean the most common symptom will still be like uh chest pain but yeah. a lot of the time it will be having feeling nauseous or they might feel like they've got palpitations and they're having an, an anxiety attack like a panic attack and i've experienced this firsthand because i had a, a female patient who came in to me and she was uh saying that she had like chest pains so her gp sent her into the hospital to come in and have some extra tests And it was a really busy day. And I remember seeing her in the kind of waiting room and she was like telling the secretary that she was really late and she had to pick up her grandkids. And I was like, this is definitely stress induced or she's got heartburn and she thinks it's a heart attack. 
anyway, um, I'm chatting to her and she tells me she's just stressed and she's like anxious and stuff like that. So I was like, even her history didn't really sound like a heart attack. So I'm like, oh, do you know, I'm pretty convinced that you're fine, but I have to do these tests mm, so I don't get yeah. sued. Do the tests. Lo and behold, she was having a heart attack. Wow. And right like, there and then. Wow. Yeah. So like she's cardiology come down and, and take her away. But it, that was like one story that really stuck in my head. You saved her life. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, I think you just got a bit of indigestion. Like, you <laughs> saved her life because you were legally yeah. obliged to do the test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? No, no. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I would have. I would have yeah. done it anyway. Were you like, also telling her, by the way, oh, this is going to be boring. We've got to do it. <laughs> While she's having a heart attack. But it's, oh, it's, sorry. Wow, wow, wow. There's obviously yeah. <laughs> But I think women are more likely to be like, I'm too busy to have to be sick. Whereas, yeah, that's like, very true. A, if a man comes into hospital, I'm like, I know it's serious because they're not going to hear, they're not going to be here for, you know, if, if they're not feeling pain. So I don't want to say that. Men like, complain more than women. We can say that. I, I like, I mean, sure. Like I, I know with my fiance, fiance, um, I know, uh, sorry, that's me. <laughs> so just, sweet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so as a side note there, um, uh, I know with it, when she, when she feels pain, I know she's in real pain. Mm -hmm. Like if she's really complaining about it, then I know she's she's not well or she's hurting or something like that. When I complain that I'm not feeling good or feel pain, it's kind of bad, but it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're phoning your mum to tell her that I you're know, salivating, I'm a baby. salivating too much. It, so. dude, is that called, like, they always call it man flu, right? There is a sort of saying where men complain a lot more than... When, but I think that's because women's uh, pain threshold is much higher because of pregnancy and things like that. Yeah, I think women are very resilient and... Again, if you've got like kids or grandkids to pick up, like you put them above you. So women are also like twice as likely as men than to be anxious and depressed. And that's really? like not just because of because we're physiologically different, but because women tend to be like primary caregivers, have lots of other things on their plate. Mm. Um, so that was like another thing. What? And that's in that's I insane. Know. But then the statistics show differently. No. In, in terms, and sorry, in terms of, so you just said women are more likely to be depressed or anxious. Yeah, than twice men. as likely. Twice men. as likely, but but three, two thirds of suicides are men. Yeah. That's different. But that's how you deal with, um, I mean, suicide doesn't have to be because of um, oh, yes. anxiety yeah, or depression. Yeah. It could be like from anything, anything really. And that's really interesting because how women deal with stress is very different to how men deal with stress. And men will either turn to alcohol or drugs or commit suicide. So they're very like aggressive external yeah. behaviors, whereas mm. like women are very internalizing. So they'll like bottle it all up. They'll ruminate like I do and <laughs> yeah. keep awake all night. And then that will manifest as anxiety, depression, OCD. So men being aggressive in it, that's exactly. So we need to change the habit of men mm. in order to stop that. Stop being, be more open. About, we always talk about men have to be more open, but actually... Why are we so wanting instant relief from these things? I think um, there's a lot of kind of societal pressure on men to mm. be a bit more stoic. Yeah. And so they feel like they don't want to burden anyone with it. So women are more likely to seek out therapy and medical help. Whereas like men will typically try to get through it through other means. And so... It's, I mean, it's a problem for both sexes then because yeah. we're do both you, not equally dealing with it very well. Do, do you think it's part societal conditioning and then is it also physiological in a man? Just the way our brains are wired, our response is to go to that aggression, that extreme place, whereas women are a bit more sort of like, I don't yeah. know, they slow things down a bit. And Yeah, I do. I think it's like, it's both biological and kind of um, environmental mm. society factors and so we can't really change our biology um but we can change how we kind of deal with things so that's like a really important conversation and I feel like and I'm sure you'll agree in the last couple of years there's been a lot more conversation around men's health and like men speaking mm -hmm. up because the mm. rates are so high suicidal rates are so high but the rates are going up so the, it's, yeah. it's not I, I don't understand that so mm. my, my confusion lies is where um they did a really scary survey in America recently, which is, they said 67% of people were, were unhappy in mm. America, 67%. That is wild. And 
is there an argument to suggest, right, that, um, okay, if we look at my grandmother, my grandfather, like I, I'm very open about my anxiety, right? And I wasn't for a long time. I suffered with panic attacks, anxiety, all these different things. So I'm fully in the mix, right? I know what mental health is. Um, and I, I, was, I was getting it during a time when no one was really talking about it. So, mm. I, you know, I remember, what, I remember just saying to all of my friends, I just feel really a bit nervous. I feel really nervous. Does anyone else feel nervous? Because I didn't really know how to explain it. And it was just severe anxiety going on. My grandmother's generation, and you know, my my mums, my dads, whoever it is, that generation never really talked about things. Mm-hmm. That it was it was wasn't really mentioned much. And if it was mentioned, you were put straight on pills or put in a psychiatric ward. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's statistics that show that you know um, people who had the similar anxiety um, nowadays were literally put were sectioned. You know, back in the '60s. So if I was one, I would be sectioned saying that I feel all these different things, right? Um, and is there a, a, an argument to say that because we are speaking about it too much, that actually it almost is a self-conflicting uh, p- prophecy? That actually, because we all now know what anxiety is and depression is, OCD is, insomnia is, actually, if you are slightly anxious, you catch onto the things and it potentially makes it worse. Or is that total no, bollocks? I, I don't agree with that. I think the way that we live our lives in society has got to such a state that it is really really generating anxiety and i think i also think interesting what you're saying about like kind of revisions in medicine i feel like there's loads of that happening right now across Mm. the board which is like super interesting yeah um but yeah i I, you think that's wrong i I, don't know i'm just i'm just i think i think there probably is obviously an element of that for sure but like we are we we are bombarded so much with data and information and just everything we do is just so unnatural now we've come so far from what we're kind of designed to deal with and I just feel like that essentially our brains are overloaded. We're fried. Yeah. Um, I think you you both have a point though. I think if you make people more aware of something, then yeah. more people are going to put their hand up and be like that. Like I have that. Yeah. Um, but I do think that we live in a very, life was a lot more simple years ago. And now we're just bombarded by things. And also there's that whole comparison thing from being online and social mm. media. So like you may have a perfectly good life, yeah but it's not as good i know as so and so who's online ah oh. and so what is happiness like when are you happy and like so many people live that oh i'll be happy when i have the house the, or the constant have... pursuit yeah. yeah i've said this before um <clears throat> i think i said on this podcast we're meant to have a village mentality right so we're meant to know 150 to 200 people that's what we're meant to know right so if you had a huge party everyone cousins family friends whatever it was that's who would come um, and out of those 150, 200 people, we have a USP, unique selling points, something that makes us ourselves. That's being the best podcaster, the best nutritionist, the best doctor, the best musician, the best person at wearing jeans, the best hopscotcher. <laughs> Sucks to be them. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but We've you know got a I mean? really, really great doctor. <laughs> you look great in those jeans. But, it, but, it's, but it's true, <laughs> right? Cosmic you, English. You have something that makes it you, yourself, right? And now what happens is, so if, you know, as the best podcaster or... or doctor or whatever it is because of social media now we log on social media in the morning early in the morning and our algorithm shows what we compare ourselves to because mm. we love uh magic our algorithm is probably going to be based around magic yours, yours is definitely not magic no but you know I, what i mean it's definitely not magic but you know what i mean there's loads of girls in bikinis <laughs> yeah. and that's why i have to go on a run every morning <laughs> but it does so we're constantly comparing ourselves to our individuals who are mm. like us and then we're constantly going well we're not better than them all the time. So that village mentality has gone out the window. And what we need to do is do that thing, which Matthew McConaughey said in a weird Oscar speech, but it's quite a good thing, is stop comparing ourselves to other people, mm. which we do all the time. I do it, right? I sit there on social media and, and I said this to, to you the other day, Alex, all three of us, we're doing pretty well, you know, in terms of the whole, the world's population, we're doing pretty well. But we can still sit there and go, well, we're not doing good enough. Mm-hmm. We're not doing good enough. And actually, we should compare ourselves to who we were yesterday, last week, the year before. As long as we're improving ourselves by that 1%, that should be enough. Mm-hmm. But we're constantly comparing ourselves to individuals on social media who we have no fucking clue about. We don't know what they're doing, what they're going through, but we just see an idolized picture of them or video of them. And we think, well, they're doing fantastic. Mm-hmm. And we need to stop doing that. As soon as we stop doing that and laser focus on ourselves, we're going to be far more happy. Yeah. Is that fair? I don't know. I, yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's easier said than done, totally. but it's fair. Totally. It's, it's so hard to do that because we are kind of being bombarded and manipulated by, yeah. you know, you've got tech 
you know, huge billion dollar companies who have people that their job is to work out how to attack our emotions, how to get into us. So it's, it's really difficult to, to bat that off. I mean, especially when you're tired, like I'm better these days at like, you know, I recognize stuff that, the, yeah. the stuff that I was addicted to, you know, Instagram and stuff like that. What were you addicted to? Huh? I was addicted to giving to charity. That was one of the, <laughs> the tough, the toughest ones. I, <laughs> I, to, I just had to give it. up. Oh God, it was hard. <laughs> but you know, when they shake those pots and they're all, oh, I just run up to them and I chuck in a 5p. <laughs> <Shake pee>. those <laughs> pots. Um, I know what you mean. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, it is yeah. really difficult. Um, but I, I feel like, I do, I do feel like society's like hitting a point now where there kind of needs to be a big reset in the way that we do a lot of things. Mm. And I think that needs, I think it's good that we're all starting to talk about all this because that's the first step i think you then have to ask why again and again and again and again until you get to the root of the yeah uh, the issue right well, well everything's moving very fast at the moment there's a famous quote which i'm going to murder which is if we can't catch our breath today how are we meant to breathe in the future which is so true right everything's going so fast yeah um hazel listen we're going to stop there for part one I want to come back for part two when I want to talk all about gut health because my gut. <laughs> We've not spoken about guts yet. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that is the yeah. whole reason we got you oh, here because his gut is. is oh. Are you ready for it? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, hold <laughs> your nose because it's going to oh be a good God. one. We'll see you in part two, right? <laughs> see you in part two. Bye bye. <laughs>
in a like non-clinical environment and I think that's really mm. important and give them time to like grieve and just talk them through it and answer their questions and yeah. I think sometimes not saying anything can be really helpful so delivering the news let them ask questions and just sit there until mm. they're ready to do what's next or wow mm. i have a question we diagnosis and mm. this actually kind of flips back to a podcast we just did with a, a guy called ed jackson who sadly well the story is pretty amazing but he, he actually d- dived into a pool and severed his spinal cord i he think didn't, it was didn't completely sever it but, or but it was pretty like much, pretty much yeah. and he was talking the, about the diagnosis that they kind of said that he was never going to walk again and amazingly he did um what like what's your view on that like do you do you tell a patient as it is what your knowledge is and you're like right okay from what i know you're probably not gonna survive or do you add a bit of hope in there because there's a lot now a lot of people are turning back to sort of ancient ways of thinking that the mind actually is incredibly Mm. powerful at healing and if you believe enough then you can heal yourself yeah i think my approach and what would be most other doctors approach is we can just give you the information that we have at the time And if there is a possibility that they would recover, I would absolutely share that with them. But if it's very slim, I would also be very honest about that because I think some people can really um, go down weird and wonderful routes when you tell them that something's Mm. not like recoverable and that can like turn into very alternative medicine, which I'm not saying is wrong, but sometimes people will forego normal medicine. So like chemotherapy, because they're like, well, I heard this, juice diet is so much better and lots of people die because of that steve jobs famously denied uh, any chemotherapy for so long because he you know he was Mm -hmm. a hippie Mm -hmm. he didn't believe in it um and then at the very end he turned to it yeah and it was almost too late yeah see that's the thing um i think i think they can go hand in hand i think the power of the mind is very we haven't fully understood it. And I definitely think no. it plays a, a role. I think, I think modern science needs to start embracing that as, as much as it has modern science, essentially yeah. like start to examine it properly and work out how powerful it is and work out how to, to harness it better, yeah. I guess. It's the whole, you know, like even placebo effect is so powerful. Because, oh my God, it's crazy, isn't it? Placebo. Yeah, it is crazy. And so I think there's this whole kind of also conversation around holistic kind of care where Obviously, mainstream medicine in the NHS is very much like medication, surgery. That's it. Yeah. Um, but there's no conversation around nutrition or exercise or sleep or stress yeah. management. And we all know that they're super important for your health. And if you include them in your recovery process, you're definitely going to have better outcomes. But doctors are too busy and to sit down with you and be like, right, So you also need to overhaul your diet. You should also exercise every day. You need to do some strength training. And that was really why I started the food medic all those years ago. Because in med school, I was like, why aren't we talking about nutrition? Like you have one hour lecture, which is mostly focused around like the function of the digestive system. Yeah. But I'm like, stroke, depression, heart disease, lots of female health conditions, skin conditions, all Mm. related to nutrition can be prevented Wow. to a degree so it's like a, it's like a 360 approach like you tr- have to like even look at mental health like is there's there were some ways that their thinking is potentially like affecting yeah their health and there's i mean i i i'm always really cautious talking about mental health and nutrition because i'm not saying don't take medication medication is so important yeah but alongside that nutrition is so important we've got loads of really interesting studies there is one in australia called the smiles trial which i think is a really nice name it's the only reason i remember it but they had two groups of patients with severe depression and one group um they all stayed on their medication but one group just had a befriending kind of social support kind of 12 week intervention the other group went on like this modified mediterranean style diet so loads of fiber colorful fruits and vegetables and they had a 33 percent reduced uh 33 of them went into remission of their depression compared what? to the other group. I think it was 8% in the befriending group. Mm. Well, and, and that's, that's just diet. down to diet. Just down to diet. And so we know that there's this huge gut brain link. And yeah. The best way to like describe that to people or how I describe it to people is like, when you're really nervous for something or really excited and you get like butterflies in your tummy, like that's basically your, your brain and your gut speaking to one another, but it goes both ways. So what you put in your gut will 
influence your brain and your mood and your that I, is, I guess then also there's a double effect whereas if you what if you believe what you're eating is helping you then your, yeah your mind is going to also be healing you totally yeah you? but but i but i definitely i, I i'm so interested in gut so and I think I think perhaps where my mine I'm interested in gut was because I was clinging onto things. We had um, Doctor yeah. Rongan. Doctor Rongan. I listened to his. I I went through this bout, which was what I found out was burnout. Mm. Um, doing a reality show too long, um, fighting and arguing, and breaking up. Too, with too much many time people, in the gym. Too much time squatting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, running. Just so much watching porn. Um, and. I basically burned out, but I didn't understand what it was. And I was constantly searching for what it is. And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a typical diagnosis. You know this with um, people incredibly anxious. You're trying to find a reason for what's going on within you. Um, and I listened to one of his episodes, which was about gut health. And the episode was, was a guy who came on who um, he went into a real bad depression. And he didn't know what the hell was going on. He tried lots of different things. Nothing worked. And he changed his diet. And he was suddenly better mm -hmm. just through diet, which you're saying today. So I became obsessed with it saying, well, obviously my gut is ruined. So I started taking, um, you know, Simproof and I started taking uh, probiotics, mm. but then it made me smell quite weird. <laughs> It made you smell. It made me smell. Like you were sweating. Yeah, like I was sweating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, like how I was much, sweating. How much were you drinking? <laughs> Loads of it. Like, yeah, I was obsessed Sweet, with it. You were sweating I was yogurt. Obsessed. I was. I, I stank. I stank. It was really weird. I smelled weird. Um, but yeah, it sounds odd. But um, I became obsessed with it. And there is this link between... Um, uh, it's uh, not endorphin. Is it endorphins? It's... Um, What's the happy thing in your like body? Serotonin. Serotonin. Yeah. Serotonin. And uh, serotonin and gut health. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. And 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 what so what can we do as individuals to change our diet in order to help our gut? Yeah, so that's a huge question. I know. No, no, it's. I mean, well, it is. But so obviously, we just talked about the gut brain connection, but also your gut is home to trillions of bacteria, well, mostly bacteria, and that's your gut microbiome, and they essentially produce chemicals and hormones that influence lots of things in your body, including your brain health and your mood. And we're only starting to understand that. So there's like, you know, these trials into how probiotics could be used in the treatment of depression or like skin I would, conditions. I would hate to be at those trials. <laughs> it would stink. Well, I don't understand. I, I haven't heard that. So what, so people are testing people who have depression with probiotics, seeing if yeah. it helps. And there's, yes. What's the success rate on it? Well, I mean, there's lots of different trials, but the thing is there's lots of different strains for probiotics. So we're not going to get it right exactly. And so right now I'm not in the position to be like, okay, if you're depressed, take this particular probiotic. But I think there's lots of interesting research emerging from so it. Probiotics, right? That There's like cultures of bacteria essentially that yeah. then go into your gut and they help you digest food better. And Yeah. Basically, that... probiotics are live beneficial microbes yeah and they digest fiber that we don't digest and then as a result of that they produce byproducts so like healthy hormones and chemicals that travel in our bloodstream and make yeah. us healthy and happy and so you can get an imbalance of good and bad bacteria because we're, we're more are we more bacteria than actual humans, humans Is yeah that right? that's crazy that's what true. yeah Nuts. Wait, hang on. See, hey, so you're saying as a doctor, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, that you're saying there is definitely a link between gut health and mental health. Yeah, 100%. Because I heard that doctors, dis doc some doctors don't believe that. I mean, oh, I would find it very hard to believe that doctors don't believe that. Now. Maybe that's me yeah. mistaken. But yeah. I mean, traditional medicine, and I only graduated from med school in 2016, and I didn't have a lecture on like the gut brain axis and how mood is influenced by nutrition. But if you sit down with any psychiatrist now or anyone who works in that field, they'll tell you there is a, a strong link. Wow. But I guess it's not as simple as eat this to cure this. And it's never like that with anything. But, you know, like even the trial that we just spoke about, like if you change your diet, you can influence your mood. Mm. Um, the tricky thing is like if you are in a deep depression, the last thing you want to do is like, yeah. you just don't even want to wash cook, yourself. Cook no. nice. So if someone's yeah. like, well, nice you could just salad. sort it out if you just had a lovely kale salad. You're yeah. like, well, I just you want Ben and Jerry's. So. Yeah, you don't even want to do anything. Yeah. And nutrition's only like one key. Like there's a strong link between like exercise, gut health and also mood and like sleep and mood. Um, and But the strongest determinant of your mood and your mental health is 
your relationships and your social support. I know. That the, that's the strongest link. Oh my God. So there's two things I want to say. Firstly, um, they, they, they now truly believe that, um, well, it's been for a while, that a, a solid exercise, and I'm not talking about just going for a walk, but like, a, like going for sort of a hard run or doing some, some strong exercise works just as well as a, as a sort of mild antidepressant. Yeah. Which is, that's, that's mad, right? I heard that firstly. And then, um, uh, secondly, I've said this before, but they um, did a, a social experiment in Harvard where, and I think it's important to repeat again, just in case there's new listeners, uh, they did a social experiment in Harvard, which is one of the only social experiments which have lasted a lifetime. Because typically what happens, funding runs out or um, uh, people get bored or die or whatever it is. And they got 700 something Harvard students in 1912 or whenever it was. And they followed them throughout their lives to find out what made them happy. Um, and they checked in every two years and they were thorough tests, like checking their brain, checking their friends, checking their family members, checking their jobs, everything. And it lasted for until they died. Right. And, um, out of 700 and something people, there were presidents, there were alcoholics, there were schizophrenics, there were businessmen, there were cleaners, there were sportsmen, low, a variety of different people. And at the end of their lifetime, what they realized is what made people fundamentally happy about other people wasn't fame, wealth, all the things you think would make them happy. It was strong relationships with friends and family members. Mm. If you have that in your life, then you have a way bigger chance of being happy. Mm hmm. Yeah. That, that, which is great because I remember when I went through my period of uh, real severe anxiety, I suppose, and thing, I think I was lonely. Yeah. I, and I'd never really thought about it. I think I was. I think I'd alienated myself away from people because I was so socially anxious because of doing a TV show. And I think that I wasn't communicating with anyone. So I felt lonely. And that's when I went into a, a weird place. Yeah. And you can be lonely in the most. Um, fortune of positions have yeah. you ever felt like it, this? It's, one, it's another one of these like modern maladies there's so many things that are cutting us off from the things that like actually make us feel good like which is nature friendship community like just being around loved ones like there's so many things that get in the way now we're just being sold shit everywhere we're being like dangled this carrot that's like oh come over here put all your energy into this and you will be happy where were you when i was lonely huh I was down the pub <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> it's late again. <laughs> but it's but that's so true, mate. I, I totally agree with you. It's these I think I think there needs to be uh, we we spoke about this a little bit. There needs to be like a a re, uh we need to reframe what success means in society because we've got it wrong. It's like success at the minute is make as much money as you can, get that fast car, get that nice house, do all these things. It needs I think success needs the the success metric needs to be like reframed. We need to yeah, have like it's so hard to, to change that. Yeah. No, I don't I don't think it is. It is it, take, it, it will take time. It's going to take, you know, hundreds a 100 year, uh, years of conditioning. We need to so move past it. I don't I don't think if we carry on on this path we're kind of going to be yeah, fucked. But, it's but we live in a society that's fueled by by money, right? Money is oxygen. Unfortunately, that's the truth of it, right? And it doesn't matter if you go anywhere in the world. If you go to um, someone selling fruit on a beach or you go to bankers, wherever, you know, you, 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 everyone is selling something or doing something in order to make cash. Like it's everywhere in the world. And I think what's it, not everywhere. It's there's, maybe, there's places where it doesn't exist and, sure. and that's where happiness is. Mm. Sure. Actually. I, I try, and monks, you know, it, it, notoriously don't really pass and exchange cash that much, but they're notoriously incredibly happy. But I, Western society, right? We, it's, it, I always, I always get nervous when talking about this because it's very easy to sit here and say, Oh, do you know what? We got to get over that thing of just who cares about success? But I suppose from a other person's point of view, they go, well, you're already successful. Yeah. So, so how can so you say that? So why don't you become unsuccessful yeah. and then have the same view? Yeah. And so that's what's really, so it's a, it's a, it's a juxtaposing cycle that we get stuck in, mm. which is where, okay, now I can sit here and go because I can pay for my rent and my food and things like that. So I'm okay. And my family's healthy. Yeah. But if you're not in that situation, you're not going to go, wow, do you know what? It's okay. Cause I'm happy because I got my friends and family members. Yeah. It doesn't matter if I can't pay for food. We, we, that, you need to get you need to be successful to live a content life but to live a content and successful life you need money in order to do that i really truly believe in some ways mm -hmm. especially in western society yeah it's a, it's a massively complex it's so complex complex situation that we're in like if if we reframe success then we probably wouldn't have these issues where you have I know, people, then I know. you have people that are struggling there wouldn't be as much of a ladder it's it's very hard like I'd, okay but it's it's also so Sticking with the gut. So in terms of diet, what can we cut out or add in on? I know this is a generalization, but
But in your experience, what can you cut out and put in that can really help us in terms of our mental clarity, mental health, and just all round healthiness? Um, so when it comes to gut health in general, like key principles, you want to get in as much diversity of plant-based foods as possible. And I think when we talk about plant-based foods, people automatically think, you're telling me that I need to go vegan. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you just need to eat lots of fruit and veg. That's great. But plant-based foods include like whole grains, like um, also fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds, nut butters. There's like a, anything that's made from plants, basically. And the more diverse, the better. So, you know, we talk about five a day, but people who have 30 different plants in their diet a week tend to be have the best gut microbiome what and that sounds like a lot 30 but, different but that plants includes herbs and spices as well try and try and name 30 i mean you won't get past 10 i could easily do go it. on go on quickly name I, 10 this podcast we don't want to do this <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah. okay we don't have much time Let's... Okay, okay bye really yeah yeah but i always feel like again like obviously like you have to be in a place of privilege to have 30 different plants in your diet. but if an you... avocado is like three quid yeah I mean, you don't have to have a avocado. No, it's just what sprung to mind. I had it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it just is. Be so healthy. It's, it's, yeah. Be healthy, get an avocado. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I so know. lots of plant-based foods and as, and like diversified. So go as colorful as possible. And if you can change it up each week, change up the different vegetables and stuff you have in your diet, then do that. Um, the other thing is you can dabble with things like probiotics, like, uh, live yogurts kefir kombucha those kind of things there's not that much evidence for them but technically they could be good for you yeah or theoretically um things that i would cut down on i'm not really a huge fan of removing stuff but anything that's like um very heavy red or processed meat i'd try to why though that why body. is that well there's a strong link between red and processed meat and colorectal cancer and so we should, in general, be reducing the amount in our diet. What's Again, colorectal cancer? Sorry. It basically of your bowel. So your oh. gut. Yeah. Um, but that is based on quite diets that have red and processed meat in every day. So the NHS recommend that you should have kind of maybe one portion a day. So I think it's 100 grams of red meat and 70 grams of processed meat a day. So basically like a rasher or a very small steak. Um, you can have that per day. Yeah. So... I mean, that's a lot, I would say. That is a lot. I don't eat red meat. I eat red meat, what, once a month? Yeah. If that. So then you're fine in, th in that regard. But a lot of typical British diets might be a fry up in the morning, which is like rasher, mm. um, sausages, all processed meat. And so by 9 a.m., you've already hit your quota and exceeded that. And if you're having that every day and you're not really having many vegetables, not the most healthy thing. Um, omega threes are really good for your gut health and also your brain health. I I take them all the time. So one thing that I take every morning. Where's the best four little pills? Best place to get omega three is it from seeds or from fish oil? I do fish oil. Well, from fish, I I wouldn't necessarily seeds. Supplement. It doesn't come you, from seeds, does it? You, you can, you can. get it from seeds, yeah. Because there's a lot of people that say that the fish oils that we're getting are not very good quality because there's a lot of crap in the oceans. Basically. Oh, perfect! I take them all so, the time. Oily fish is the best source of omega-3, but you can get it from like flaxseed and chia seed and walnuts. Wait, I, I'm not kidding. To, to listeners who's listening now, I, I started taking B12. Okay. Because I wasn't getting enough sunlight. That's vitamin D. That's vitamin D. <laughs> Jesus. You need to get a nutritionist. All right. Yeah. Vitamin B12, you'd get in like meat-based products typically. That's why vegans uh, are, you can't get it from a vegan diet. Maybe I'm taking vitamin D then. Vitamin D yeah. for sunlight. And I, and I started taking omega-3. I, 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 they, they, there can't just be a coincidence. It can't be like it can't be placebo. I don't think. No. I, honestly, whenever whenever I stop taking it and I go and after a while I feel a bit, oof, and I go, oh, I should probably start taking those pills again. I then start taking them. They're a bit expensive. They cost like thirty quid or whatever. To, so they're quite expensive. Go that I, I feel so much more energized. What do you just? Would you say you're taking vitamin D and? I take vitamin D and I take omega three. Okay. And I take four omega threes every morning and I take a vitamin D. And I swear to God, my mood, my stress, everything's lifted. It's just, I feel so much better. And what I what typically as a males do, you start taking it. So you, you start feeling better. Then you just forget about taking it because you feel better. And then you stop feeling good again. So you're like, oh shit, why was I feeling good? Oh, probably because I was taking those things. Yeah. 
And it doesn't drastically move, but I definitely 100%. I think, I think vitamin D is really important. I think we nowadays, we don't, we're not like outdoors enough and we're always yeah. like covering our bodies. So yeah. we don't actually get, and people put sun cream on the whole time, which is probably not great to do that all the time. We need to get that. Yeah, get that vitamin D in us. What about... Um, my, my, my biggest problem, I'm quite good at doing a lot of the things you said, but sugar, I'm like so addicted to sugar. Ever it's bad, is. sugar's not good. I have a sweet company. But we have good sugar. <laughs> Shit, should have said that. Yeah, yeah, we, no. have, we have great well, sugar. We have good sugar. I feel like a little bit of sugar is fine. Like sugar is always demonized. It's a treat. Yeah, I think obviously having too much sugar in mm. your diet isn't great for you. And we definitely in the UK eat too much of it. But if you're getting sugar from like fruit and vegetables, which is a small amount of vegetables, but in fruit, then that's fine. Whereas a lot of people worry about like the fruit and sugar. But if you're having fruit from safe fizzy drinks or processed foods and candy and stuff, like that's different. It's not yeah. like it's not coming in like wrapped in a fiber layer, let's just say. So oh, it yeah. kind of hits your body a bit quicker. But yeah, I think... I'm not a big fan of saying any foods are should be cut out. I think like all foods fit, but it's finding the balance because once you remove that one thing, that's then the Adam's apple that everyone wants. Yeah. Mm. And you just go down a road. But I think if you focus on what you can add in, naturally those things become slightly smaller in your diet mm. because you're so satisfied from everything else. Well, typically. What about gluten? Yeah, gluten. What about it? <laughs> yeah. What, what, what about what, it? Yeah. Do you, yeah. you like it? Yeah. yeah. Is it, what about it? You like gluten? <laughs> Do you eat gluten? Yes. Okay. Why wouldn't I? Oh, I don't know. I got told I shouldn't <laughs> eat gluten. I was told something that like 63% of us are lactose intolerant in some sort of way. So we probably shouldn't drink milk. Mm. And then gluten we shouldn't really have in our diet because it's man-made. No. So gluten is just a protein in wheat. Okay. And, um, but wheat was man-made. <laughs> so who's, wheat wasn't just. Who here. is your nutritionist? I don't know. <laughs> you, you, you're lacking sunlight. You need vitamin B12. <laughs> yeah. No, but but wheat was wheat. Gluten was put into wheat. Maybe I maybe I'm talking. No, I think I think I'm talking absolute shit. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> good. So. I think I think it's maybe unnatural the amount that we eat of it. Djokovic, like famously, was in like the top hundred or whatever tennis player. He cut out gluten, all these different things, and yeah, went plant Yeah, that was just total like <laughs> nonsense. Awesome. He was <laughs> also <laughs> quite good at tennis. Yeah, okay, it's he was. A, and so then people like correlate it. They're like, "Wow, if I cut out gluten, I'm going to be incredible at tennis." And it's just not, not what happens. So if you have celiac disease, which yeah. is an autoimmune disease against gluten, you don't want to have gluten in your diet. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you tolerate gluten fine, then there's absolutely no evidence to say that's harmful. And actually, if you go on a gluten free diet, you typically have to go on like really stripped back restrictive diet. And you can be more at risk of nutritional deficiencies. Mm. Diets typically lower in protein, lower in fiber and is more spenny. So I just wow. don't really recommend it. But there's lots of like, um, like American doctors who have written books on gluten and you know they say it like damages your brain and stuff and it it it's caused a lot of fear that like i the, that's why i asked you because i feel like i'm constantly trying to unravel that yeah with people yeah yeah that's so that's what i yeah it. yeah or like women with uh like health problems like polycystic ovary syndrome or endometriosis are always told like cut out gluten based on like very small studies that don't really have much evidence so you got like women who come to you and they've cut out everything because they're like this will fix me i'm like I know, you just solution. need some medical support mm. wow so I, I guess every individual is so different in terms of what their needs are right? yeah because no no one's the same in terms of like what nutrition works no that's true well for them like, it, is it like you can do like is epigenetics and stuff now you can like really understand your body on like a deeper level like what it needs is that right yeah i think i think the whole there's like this term personalized nutrition which mm. i don't know if you guys know tim specter he's like i heard that name yeah yeah he does the zoe project project and has written a book on gut health and he is basically in that space and i think that will be where we go we'll start like basing our nutrition based on like our microbiome our blood tests lots of other things um because what people respond to well, does vary, like whether people respond to carbohydrates or there's like a lot of genetics there, but yeah. also our environment. And so that's epigenetics is like how our genetics are shaped. Wow. Because they're, they're like learning now that environment actually has way more of an impact on our genetics. It's not like inherited as much as it's not like set in stone. Like yeah. What we eat and what we, we surround ourselves with actually impacts it way more. 
Yeah, it's um, it depends on what we're talking about. Like some things are one hundred percent hereditary, and then others are manip- manipulated. Jamie, so Jamie, for example, was ginger, and now he's like <laughs> bright blonde. It's fascinating. I don't know. <laughs> selling me out right there. Aren't you? <laughs> this is own genetics. Yeah, this is just the old genetics. Um, so. Hey, so what you're saying is really interestingly is that if you focusing on your diet, look, we, we know that medication can work and for, for mental health and all these different things. Um, exercise can help, but also focusing heavily on a diet, a healthy diet, a good diet, um, can really improve your mood in yeah. lots of different ways. Yeah. yeah. That's insane. Yeah, it is really, it's, I think it's really powerful as well. Yeah. That you it, have control over it. Cause you have control over it. Uh, with the caveat that like sometimes shit happens in life and you can't just depend on your diet mm, to hold mm. you through like pandemic. But, but I, but to anyone listening to this, um, who is going through a tricky time or is feeling a bit, I don't know, under the weather in whatever way it is, you know, try it, try it out, change your diet a little bit, become a little bit healthier, see if it works. It's a, it, I know it's a bit of discipline. You probably don't want to do it. You probably yeah. last thing you want to do, but if you give it a go, it may really improve yeah. your mood well, one thing that really helps me with it is like there's no such thing as perfection i know like yeah. so like if you do mess up and you eat some crap it's not like everything's gone out the window just like go back to it and like that one yeah. percent just keep keep trying where you can that's like, what you almost need to do for mental health as well so like if it's having a slice of birthday cake and you're going out with friends then in that moment that's the best thing you can do for your mental health mm. and so it's kind of having that flexibility as well yeah but i think we can all agree that like when you are going through a bit of a crap time whether you feel physically a bit low or or mentally yeah and if you set out i timed that oh yeah you timed that with that siren that <laughs> was great nice. yeah you gotta get out of here yeah that's literally in the room <laughs> <laughs> but if you start focusing on your nutrition or you're like i'm gonna you know get up and go to the gym every day or go out for a walk and i'm gonna get into bed early after a week you feel better, right? Yeah, you feel totally. Better. And I think also part of it's going to be placebo and also storytelling yourself, like you're looking after you. It's self care. I know. So if you can do those things, that's massively going to improve. And and health. telling yourself as much as you hate doing it and you don't want to do good it, for me. it, this is good for me. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm going to get better. As much as you just don't believe it, saying it helps. Mm-hmm. That smile um, thing you said that they did in yeah. Australia. I mean, just do that walking in nature. There's amazing statistics about people who um, who heal quicker in hospitals who have a view of of garden yeah, yeah, of yeah. Out the outside. It's quite interesting. It's like basically, if you say it enough and you and you correct it that, sounds... that that thought, that negative thought, you correct it. If you do that enough, you eventually do start <laughs> to know. believe it on yeah. a subconscious level, which is where the healing apparently. And can... the thing is, is that so many people have said it. It can't not be true, or it can't not help. So just give it a go. Yeah. Give it a go. Yeah. Um, Hazel, you also, so your new book is coming out when? 7th of July. That is so exciting. What's it called? The Female Factor. So very different to my previous books, which were all nutrition. Yeah, but we we can get that on your Instagram and we can get it on in Amazon or every place. Yeah, it's available to pre-order now. That, go and <laughs> grab it. We'll leave the link below in yeah, the description, 100%. Does, does um, it focus on nutrition or is it uh, yeah, kind of... It whole? focuses on four core areas of lifestyle actually that we spoke about. So nutrition, movement, sleep and stress. But like sort of like we discussed through a female lens. So I'm kind of like, right, we know what it says from a male perspective. Yeah. But like... What should women be eating across their life when they're pregnant, across the menstrual cycle, during the menopause? How should they move? Um, Like, why do women sleep worse? Why are women more anxious and depressed? And and like, what can you do practically? So it's not just me like listing out things that are crap. It's like, this is the problem. This might help you. I love that. (laughs) Um, I want to say a huge thank you for coming on. Thank you. I know how busy you are. Have you had a fun time? Was it what you expected? Yeah, it was fun. Was it right? Yeah, it was good. Hey, you like that? See? (laughs) That's approval. I like it. I like it. Stop seeking for approval. Yeah, I always do. Validation, validation, validation. It makes you feel better. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, Hazel, listen, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Go and check out your Instagram. Go and buy your books, everything. It's super interesting. Go and check out your podcast, which is called The Food Medic. The Food Medic. We can get it wherever you get any podcasts as well, right? Yes. Um, thank you so much. What we like to do at the end of the podcast is leave our listeners with something inspirational. Oh, you put me on the spot there. I know. I think based on our conversation, I'm going to say failure is not final. It's like my life motto. 
Is that inspirational? That was very inspirational. I, like I felt it. it. I like that it. was good. Hazel, thank you so much. Everybody, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye!